Hello, hello. How are you doing, Jennifer? Oh, let me unmute you really quick. Okay, try that again. How are you? Sorry, I'm doing good. Great, awesome. Where are you joining from? I am in Brighton, Michigan. Okay, awesome. Where is that on the on the mission? I'm um, right around there. Cool. It's just <laughs> a little um, north of Ann Arbor. Okay, great. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Um, beach. I um this is my first year doing design technology for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Oh wow, that sounds like a fun class. Yeah, it's a I have a old like wood shop, so all the wood shop tools, all the space, and then I have a regular classroom and just doing computer science and engineering and maker stuff. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I, I was in a similar classroom to that just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, there's a school called Montour that they have an old wood shop that like. It's a wood shop, but it's also got 3D printers and CNC machines in there now, and yeah. like a computer lab and a classroom all kind of smushed together. So there's always kind of something going on. But that was just for the high school. You said yours is sixth or eighth? Yeah. No, this, I'm hoping to get like 3D printers and laser cutters and things like that, but it's all about money. And then I'm not certified because they want um, teachers to have the um, like industrial technology certification. So I don't have that, but I'm definitely able to teach this class. But so they said we can do this for two years, but I don't know what will happen after that. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, I remember him. You remember Matt? Yeah. From ISTE like two oh. years ago. Hey. Hey. Bird brain. Bird brain um, I actually took out my hummingbird um, float. Oh, no way. Were, yeah. you, were you part of the, the workshop where you guys made the hummingbird parade floats? Yeah. That's awesome. Because we're doing um, our physical computing projects, and one of my kids needed a servo. So then I'm like, I already have these servos. I wonder if we can run your – we could probably put your micro bit here. So we're going to – because I only have that one hummingbird. Yeah. So I'm like, let me see, because it's still all connected to the, the thing. So we're yeah. going to work on that tomorrow. Which um which parade float did you make? I couldn't be at ISTE that year, um, but I, I kept up with everybody. It was a parenthood one where they were uh, the baby. Um, yeah, that sounds so sweet. Your video cut out a little bit, so I might be a little delayed coming back to you, but. Um, I remember that one. I remember yeah. seeing seeing tweets of that one. Do you remember that I, one, Matt? I remember that one too. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, very cool. Well, I'm gonna set the norm for our for our group of like everybody being muted unless they're talking. So is it okay if I mute you, Jennifer? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it was it was nice to get to meet you and get to hear a little bit about what you teach. That's great. I'm gonna unmute you, Mark. Let's see if that worked. Nice. How is everybody? Hey. Good. <laughs> doing well. Good. Doing well. Matt, good to see your face, other than just your name. <laughs> I've heard your name a couple of times, thanks to Kelsey, but I haven't actually got to see you. Uh, I apologize that you have to see my face, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you and Matt can be the beardy ones, and it'll be, you guys can form a whole club. It'll be great. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's a, <laughs> a slippery slope right there. <laughs> That's great. Well, we'll give it a couple more minutes to see if anybody else will be joining us live. I have a feeling a few people might join late or might um, just watch the recording. Um, just they might end up kind of catching up on it afterwards. So. so I learned a little bit about Jennifer, and I know Matt, and I know Mark. And then the other person joining us is Helen Gee. Um, if I uh, unmute you, Helen, let's see if you're even muted. Oh, you may not um, have your capabilities on. Um, but if you want in the chat window, um, it, I would love to just like hear a little bit about you, um, Helen. So like, what do you teach? Where are you located? I had Jennifer point out on the mitt where she was. 
Was that you talking, Helen? No. Oh, I heard somebody talk. It might have been Helen, actually. Looks like you might have muted. Might have been my kid. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Hi, Helen. How's it going? All right. Yeah. Well, we will. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started, and then if anybody else joins late, we'll kind of get to get to know them then. So awesome. Um, well, I'll start out. Um, there we go. I'll start out by just introducing myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Kelsey Derringer, and I am the professional development coordinator with Bird Brain Technologies. And um, I travel around the country, and I teach teachers coding and robotics. So we're based out of Pittsburgh, which I'm joining you from a basement in Pittsburgh, PA. Um, but in the chat window, just so we kind of get used to using it, why don't we all drop in where we're all coming from, your city and your state. So I'll put mine in there, Pittsburgh, PA. And we can kind of hear where everybody's coming from, because we're going to be using that chat window a couple different times today. So we've got Mark coming in from Lansing. Awesome. Hey, we've got somebody from, uh, Helen's coming in from San Francisco. Awesome. Very cool. So a little different time zone. The, the sun's probably still up there. Color me jealous. It's not probably up here anymore. Uh, Monica from South Florida. I'll actually be going to South Florida next month to Miami for um, FETC. So if you, uh, you want to meet up at FETC, um, Monica, that would be awesome. So thank you. Um, cool. Well, we can start, uh, yeah, dropping where we're, where we're from and who each other is in there. And then I'm also going to have Matt Chilbert, who is the one who is waving now. He's got a beard and a hat. He's actually in the same room as me. He's just in a different part of the room. Um, and he's kind of running, uh, running background ops today. So he's going to drop a Google Doc in the chat window. And if you guys want to open that up, let's just take a look at it real quick. Um, once he drops that link in there, if you want to open it up, I'm, I'm running pretty slow right now. that's okay. His, uh, he's working off a little Chromebook and so it's a little <laughs> laggy, but when you get on there, you'll see there's an agenda and then there's a, uh, there's an icebreaker and it says, please sign in here. And so as we're doing some introductions, I'm going to have Mark introduce himself. If you just click on that link and just sign in there, that lets us know who's actually attending the webinar. Um, because we we know who signed up for it, but that lets us know uh, how many people we actually had and helps us keep track of like who's who's joined us and who hasn't joined us. So when you get to the Google Doc, just click on the link that says please sign in here. So um, yeah, I mentioned um, I work for BirdBrain. Uh, my name is Kelsey Derringer, and I'm the PD coordinator. So I mentioned that I teach teachers coding and robotics, but another part of my job is that I help to write and invent and um, come up with all of the online support materials, learning support materials that we have on BirdBrain as well. So the video tutorials, the printable lesson plans, um, the organization of the projects, all of those kinds of things, the printable student resources, the assessment guides, I help um, come up with all of those as well, which is great because I'm the person who gets to meet the most teachers too, so I get to kind of pick all of their brains as I do that. Um, so I see you guys join in the Google Doc. That's great. Make sure you click the please sign in here link. And then I'm going to kick it over to Mark because I'd love for him to introduce himself and um, just tell, tell us a little bit about McCall. Tell us about the organization and your role in it. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad to, uh, that we have this great opportunity to partner with BirdBrain to bring a really good workshop here or webinar here during CS Ed Week. So if you're not following that hashtag, hashtag CS Ed Week, I would really encourage you to do so. It's a, a great place uh, for resources tied to computer science awareness. Uh, McCall is the Michigan Association for Computer Users in Learning. We are a 29,000 plus membership organization uh, striving to integrate ed tech effectively in classrooms in Michigan and beyond as we have members in 43 states and eight countries. Um, we have an annual conference, which I think Kelsey is going to talk about a little bit later for her role there this year, which we are beyond excited for, um, and then do several other events, the most recent of which was our first ever statewide computer science summit, bringing around 400 people together from across the state of Michigan uh, to debut, aware, create conversation around the brand new state of Michigan K-12 computer science standards. Um, I'm the executive director, so that means I get to be on things like this, representing a lot of great people that are much smarter and 
do a lot of more awesome things than I do. So excited to be here and uh, looking forward to our time together today. So for teachers who, there may be some teachers who are on the call who are already part of McCall, but so um, is it free to join McCall? Is that a free thing to be part of? Yep, so okay. McCall does not have a dues any longer. We got rid of that about seven years ago. Cool. Um, total free membership, it just costs to be a part of our certain events throughout the year. And you can visit yeah. McCall.org yeah. uh, for more information um, on our professional development opportunities. And I heard you mention you've got members in a bunch of different states and even different countries. So I know we have someone coming in from San Francisco, someone coming in from Tucson. And it's like if they are if they find that they're interested in McCall and what you guys are doing and um, the resources, maybe online resources that you guys have, they're free to join as well. Yeah. So if you hit McCall.org, we actually have built out a new pathway. It's called our professional learning channel. Um, you can actually go see all of our opportunities opportunities. We have a couple of book studies open right now. We also have this webinar. We had another one yesterday on equity and accessibility in computer science. Um, and then we have our community, which is where we house our digital articles uh, and resources that impact practice. Uh, and then of course our events, right? So that's still our bread and butter is all of the professional development events that we do uh, year round. Very cool. Um, I, I know when um, when you and I first met, the thing that I really enjoyed talking to you about most was equity. So I was really glad that we got to, that we're getting to collaborate on this webinar today. This is great. Um, cool. So um, I'm gonna take back over the screen here. That would be uh, <laughs> uh, I just have better lighting. That's the whole thing. And that's Matt's sure. fault. Matt does the lighting. Sure, um, that's what we'll go with. <laughs> that's what we'll tell everybody. Um, but um, I'm interested in doing just a little icebreaker for us. So the title of today's webinar is CS Equity Through Creative Robotics. So I bet all of us are at least somewhat interested in this topic of equity, but there's a lot of great reasons to be interested in coding and robotics. And so if you go to menti.com, and you can either do that on your computer if you're joining from a computer, or even from your smartphone, just go to your like browser on your smartphone. And if you type in menti.com, and then if you put in these three numbers up here, 93, 19, 71, it's going to ask you this question, why do you think we should teach coding and robotics? And I'd love to hear your top two answers, um, the top two things. And if equity is one of your top two, put that one in. But I think it would be interesting for us to just see why, what brought each of us to the table. And so while you guys are filling that in, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got brought to the CS and coding table. Um, I'm actually a certified middle school and high school English teacher, not computer science or science or engineering or anything like that or math. Um, and I, I loved teaching middle school English. I taught seventh and eighth grade for a couple years in Missouri. And I loved it. Um, but when I moved to Pittsburgh, I started teaching for this after school girls only STEM club. So um, it was for fourth through eighth grade. And it was primarily in like the inner city parts of Pittsburgh. Um, when I was teaching it. However, when I, uh, I eventually became an administrator for that program and I was teaching and administering 40 different sites in three different states. And I was like writing the curriculum and teaching the teachers and things like that. But my girls that I taught was, was primarily these fourth grade girls in um, Wilkinsburg, just outside PA, um, which is a, 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 just a neighborhood outside Pennsylvania, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And my girls that I taught were primarily um, African American, they were primarily lower income, and they were really engaged in a lot of the engineering things that we had, like note card towers and slime and glitter lip gloss and like all those kinds of things that you, you do to get girls engaged. And when it came to coding and robotics, it was interesting, those, that was just like two weeks of this year long program. Um, but we started out with Scratch and using some activities off of code.org, which I really love. And there were some girls who were pretty engaged in it and some who weren't. And they were not excited about it. I actually, when I first told the girls that we were going to be doing robotics, we were going to be using robot, we were going to be doing the Lego Mindstorms, the ones that turn into bugs. And so it was an after school program, so girls could choose to be there or not. And my girls, I said, All right, girls, I'll see you on Monday. We're going to be making robot bugs. And they were not jazzed. Uh, in fact, one of them told me, she was like, Miss Kelsey, how long are you going to be doing this for? I'll come back to Tech Girls when it's over. And I was like, oh, no, um, just kidding. We're doing slime again on Monday. Okay, see you then. Like, I got to rethink my curriculum, right? And so um, 
I found that like the way that I was presenting coding and robotics was not appealing to my girls. So for me, when it comes to why do I want to teach robotics, for me, it was all about equity. And it was all about equity and joy. I wanted my girls to have the same opportunities for joy in, and creativity with technology that I saw other kids having. I saw boys having a really good time making robot bugs, but my girls were not having a good time. And they didn't feel, I like to use the phrase, invited to the party. They didn't feel invited to the coding party. Um, the invitation wasn't designed for them. So when I heard about Hummingbird and when that got presented to me, um, the way I presented that to my girls was I said, all right, who wants to make some cardboard animals? And they were like, yes. And I was like, do you want to make your cardboard animals move? And they were like, yes. And I was like, we can do that with some coding and robotics. And they were like, okay, sure. But they did it. That was the side door, like, like robot petting zoo was the side door into which we got into coding and variables even. We got into some really advanced stuff for fourth and fifth graders because they were really motivated to make that. So looking at some of you guys' responses, looks like we have a lot of people interested in um, technological, social, and scientific innovation. You wanna um, create opportunities for that. Personal agency and joy, that one was a big one for me too. And then we've got a, a smattering. We've got a lot of different reasons. And I think the important thing to remember is that all of these are good reasons to want to do coding and robotics in any classroom, not just in a STEM classroom, in an English classroom, or in a science classroom, or in an after-school program. These are all great reasons. And I think that, um, especially with Hummingbird and especially with the new Finch, we're able to do a lot of these things really well. So I think it's useful. We're gonna start by talking about Hummingbird, which um, I know some of you guys have used before. I was talking with Jennifer earlier. She came to a workshop a couple years ago and has actually built with a Hummingbird. Um, we're gonna start out talking about Hummingbird, but we're also gonna talk about the brand new Finch 2.0. So I think when you open up a Hummingbird, it kind of looks like a bunch of like wires. And this is actually a much nicer presentation than I got when I first started with Hummingbird about five years ago. I got a gallon sized baggie, plastic baggie, full of what appeared to be wires. And my administrator said, you're doing robots next week. And I said, uh, I, I don't know how to do robots. Uh, is there a training or something you're gonna send me to? She was like, nope, you get the internet. There's something out there. Okay, tall, tall order. I can do this. I'm a capable person. So um, back then, I, I really appreciate code.org. That was, that was my introduction to coding. And I really like how they don't call teachers teachers. They call teachers lead learners, which I think is such a great frame of mind to be in, especially when we're doing, when we're, our focus is equity, because we always need to be learning. We always need to be responding to what our students need. So we always need to be asking those questions. So I love that reframe of what a teacher is. Um, so I think this, this, even opening it up, even though all the little parts are labeled and stuff, this is a little bit hard to understand what a hummingbird is. So I think it might be useful to just talk about what a robot is to start off with. So a robot is something that senses, thinks, and acts. And so that means that it gathers data and information, it decides what it's gonna do, and then it does something. So with the hummingbird, it comes with a bunch of different sensors. There's a distance sensor, there's a sound sensor, there's a uh, light sensor, and there's a dial sensor, like a twisty dial sensor like that. So there's four different sensors that you can plug in. And then the thinking happens on the board. This is your hummingbird, this is the micro bit. I'll talk about the difference between those two in just a minute. But that's where the programming and the thinking happens. And then the actions are motors, so you can make things move, and LEDs, so you can light things up. So that's your basic robot that you're gonna make with a hummingbird. It senses, gathers data, plans what it's gonna do, and then it does stuff. And when I first heard about a hummingbird, when I first started learning about it, I was like, oh, like, okay, it's got lights, it got, it's got motors that like spin around, but like, I don't know, I kind of wish it like did more stuff. But the thing is that a hummingbird is designed so that these outputs can be combined with any craft material to make anything that you can imagine. So a motor just goes back and forth or round and around, but what you choose to do with that is totally up to you. Maybe you make a little Harry Potter robot that looks around. Maybe you make a muscles and bones activity where your arm is raising and lowering. Maybe you make a protractor or a Blinken or an interactive map of migration patterns. 
whatever you want to make, you can because you can combine these simple little parts here. You can hot glue right onto them and make whatever you want to make out of it. Um, and so um, I think it's important to um, to note when we when we're talking about creativity, we're talking about like why this craft supply section, why that's important. Um, it, it all has to do with where the hummingbird and the finch came from. They came out of um, Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh, and they were concerned with this question of how do you engage girls in coding better. And so um, that was their target group that they first started out with. But we found a couple of factors, which I'll share with you in just a second. But we found that those factors not only address girls, but they also address all five of the underserved communities in STEM. So girls, students of color, students of lower socioeconomic status, um, students with learning exceptionalities, and rural students. All five of those groups are just traditionally underserved by STEM and STEM curriculum. And so if you can find a way to serve one, those same strategies can work for all five. So we found that there were a couple of factors that really mattered to girls' engagement. One was making the code physical. Take it off the screen and put it in the real world. Make it, make it move in front of me. Um, factor number two was give girls meaningful creative choices. And when I say meaningful, like make it pink, is not really a meaningful creative choice. If it's a bug, my girls weren't into bugs. Even if it was a pink bug, they wouldn't have been into it, right? But what animal do you wanna make? Any animal, that's a meaningful creative choice. You can make a bug. I had girls who were really into praying mantises and all kinds of things, right? Or you could make a fluffy bunny, or you can make a unicorn or a dragon, or whatever you can think of, those are meaningful creative choices. And then the third factor, they weren't necessarily researching this, but they found that it was true that the supplies that you offer students to build with in the physical world matter to their engagement. So if you put a bunch of stuff out on a table that they've never seen before, they don't really know like how to approach that. Versus if you put a bunch of craft supplies out on a table, craft supplies like pipe cleaners, right? Or um, straws or craft sticks like so. They know how to work a craft stick. They grew up using those things. And that goes for girls and students of color and students of low socioeconomic status. They've probably had access to these things, right? Rural students. So you give them supplies that they're familiar with and then this thing that they're not familiar with, but through those familiar supplies, they feel invited to the party at that point. You know what I mean? So, um, with that in mind, like craft supplies kind of seems like, oh yeah, that's kind of cool, but it's actually a meaningful way to increase equity when you're, when you're trying to um, give more students access to coding and computer science and invite more students to the party, um, as it were. So um, I'm going to show you just really briefly how to program a hummingbird, what that might look like. And this is just one way to program a hummingbird. We're going to get a light to blink. We're going to uh, talk about how that might work a little bit. So let me clear off my programming space here for a minute. Da -da -da. Okay, so let me switch that over. So the things that we're going to start out with, and I'm going to zoom in here for a minute, the things that I'm going to grab out of my kit are we're going to grab the battery pack for power, we're going to grab the USB cord, um, and when you're initially programming, you can program with a Chromebook with a laptop Windows or a laptop Mac. You can program with a, an iPad or a tablet or a smartphone. Basically, whatever you've got access to that, can, that you can touch and program with, we can program with it. And then you'll need the Hummingbird and the Microbit. And so um, these two pieces, I, these two were snapped together before. I just unsnapped them. Just to talk briefly about what these are, this is a Microbit. It's a type of microcontroller, like an Arduino or really any small, electronic device has some kind of a microcontroller in it. But the main difference between a micro bit and something like an Arduino is that Arduinos were, came out 15 years ago or so, and they were really cool because it made it finally cheap enough for regular people to do robotics in their basements. And that's who they were designed for, sort of like basement enthusiasts with time and the ability to like buy another board if you fried one, if you plugged it in wrong. It was like 15 bucks for an Arduino, super cheap. This is also like 15 bucks. However, 
this was designed for educators in classrooms. So you can't really use an Arduino with a bunch of third graders, like 30 sweaty third graders in a room are not gonna be able to use Arduinos. They're just too difficult to connect to. You have to breadboard or pin them out, things like that. But this right here, this has some things that are built in. It's got these A and B buttons that you can use as inputs. This is a five by five LED display. So you can scroll words or numbers or symbols across it and things. Down here, these are some ports down here where you could use some alligator clips and you could attach a couple LEDs or motors right to it down there. And if you flip it over, first of all, you might see that it says BBC. We don't make the micro bit, the BBC makes it actually. Um, and it's also got some other cool features. So it's got an accelerometer, so it knows when it's being tilted. It's got a compass, so it knows what direction it's pointing. It's got a radio feature, not to play music, but to um, communicate through radio frequencies. So you can have one micro bit talk to another. Super powerful little device. There's at least a semester's worth of high quality physical computing curriculum that goes with this. Micro bits are super powerful little tools. However, if you want to really get into robotics with it, there's only four ports on the bottom there, so you can only connect four things. And if you want to connect a, a, like a bunch of motors and stuff, you'll probably need a shield because most, like these are five volt motors and this is a three volt board and so you need a shield so you don't blow out the board and like, ah, that suddenly just got too complicated for a room full of third graders, right? So what we did, so we made it so you could, whoop, you could snap your micro bit right into your hummingbird. And so now on the hummingbird, if I zoom in a little bit more, you can see that on the hummingbird, you've got two tricolor LED ports where you can plug in uh, RGB, red, green, blue, tricolor lights. You've got three single color LED ports. Those are the yellow ones. These little black towers over here that are numbered, there's four motor ports. You can plug in four motors at once. And there's three sensor ports along the bottom, plus this thing in the middle is a buzzer. So that's 13 things you can run off of the same like brain. And the way to connect them is super simple. So I'm gonna show you that with a single color LED to start off with. I'm also gonna plug in my battery pack. There we go. And turn it on. Soup, there we go. So now it's on and I'm gonna plug in an LED. Let's see. So the way to plug in an LED, it's super simple. See how it says port one there and then it's got positive and negative above it? Well, these wires on my, here's my LED. These wires, there's a black one and a green one. This one's gonna be a green LED when it turns on. The black wire always goes in the negative port and you push down a button, insert the wire at about a 45 degree angle. Oops, try again. Push down the button, insert your wire and let it up. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the green wire in the positive port. There you go. So now that's really securely attached and that's done really easily. No soldering, no uh, bread boarding, um, no alligator clips that are gonna come off. And so this guy is ready to go now to be programmed. So I'm actually gonna show you what it's like to program with an iPad. However, note that the, um, the, the process for programming your Hummingbird with a Chromebook or a laptop is gonna be super similar to what we're gonna do. So let me pull out my iPad here. And I've got an app open called Bird Blocks. Bird Blocks is a free app. It's a block-based programming app, um, like Scratch or Snap. It's a, you can download it on your phone right now if you want. It works for Android um, and uh, iOS, all the things. Okay, so let me scooch this over so everything's in frame. Okay, there we go. So um, if you've never, so, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect to my Hummingbird. I'm gonna connect device. And this is flashing GBT, which stands for Glacial Blue Timber Wolf. That's how you find your Hummingbird in a sea of hummingbirds in a classroom. And so now I am connected. See how all the blocks just turned turquoise? Now I know I'm connected. So to get my light to turn on, I'm going to drag out a block that says bit LED1. That's referring to the port number. And now it's at 0% brightness, but I could type 100% brightness in there, click the block, ta-da, and I just turned it on. And this is all done wirelessly through Bluetooth. So um, that makes that really, really simple to be able to program. If I wanted to turn it off, I could drag another one out, leave it at 0%, do like that. And now I can blink a light. But that's pretty labor intensive. 
So if I snap them together, I want it to blink on and off forever, like so. Watch what happens when I click that. Ooh, that's blinking really fast. Mm, let's say I want to slow it down. I would just make it wait in between those two programs. And now it's going on all the way to 100%, and it's waiting for a second. And then it's going off to 0%, and it's waiting for a second. And it's repeating that over and over again. Um, the name of the app was called Bird Blocks, B-I-R-D-B-L-O-X. Yeah. Can you add Jennifer back in? Yes. Thank you. There we go. Um, and would you also run upstairs and grab me a pinch, too? Mm -hmm. I forgot one upstairs. Um, bird Blocks. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Um, so that's a, a free app for tablets and iPads. However, um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can program your hummingbird. So let me kind of show you what these, oh, actually, before I get into that. So, okay, we've got a light blinking, but the thing about a hummingbird is like, this is just sort of the beginning of what you need to do to make something out of a hummingbird. It's the beginning of the opportunity because, okay, it's a blinking light, but it's like, it's kind of not a thing yet, right? So let me show you how we could turn it into a thing. Okay, I'm gonna grab a cutting board, a piece of cardboard, like so, and an X-Acto knife. And I'm gonna make a stupid little hummingbird project right in front of your very eyes. So I'm gonna do this little hack where I'm gonna cut an X in the cardboard, because I wanna poke my LED through the cardboard. Um, but we found that like trying to smush it in like this way, like smushing it through the cardboard, doesn't, doesn't mount it like we want it to be mounted. So I'm gonna take my LED out of the holes and I'm gonna thread it through here now, through this little X that I've made. Punch it through. There we go. Punch it through. There we go. And I'm gonna thread it through here. Okay, look how that mounts on there, really nice. It's like really flush with the edge there. That looks nice. And then I'm gonna bring this back out and plug it back in. Put the negative wire in, there we go. And the positive wire back in, there we go. All right, now, okay, all right, this is starting to look like something. Let me get a marker here. So I'm gonna make a little, I'm gonna make it into something. Okay, so it's got a green light, so I'm gonna use a green marker. Okay. If you would like in the chat window to guess what I'm making, <laughs> you can feel free to do so. Okay, I've got a little head. I'm gonna make a little body. Okay. Okay, I am an excellent artist, as you can tell. I'm a confident artist, which is the first step to being an excellent artist, <laughs> I think. I'm gonna give him a little smile, and he's gonna be doing like, Peace, y'all. There we go. Did you guess a stumpy little alien guy? Then you were right. Shrek, yeah, a stumpy little Shrek. Perfect, great guess, Mark. Nice work. So, okay, like this, this is a project now. This is a little something, right? This is engaging. They can make whatever character they want. I was with a, a teacher who was doing a superheroes unit with just an LED and, and they could, make a superhero that they've seen before like this, or they could um, make up a superhero. If they didn't see the superhero that they wanted in the world, they could invent one. So I saw a girl invent a superhero with the power to talk to animals. That was the superhero she wanted. And so she made the, the hands light up on this superhero who could talk to animals. Oh my gosh, love it. Um, so there's so many ways to engage it. Okay, so this is what we would call like the low floor, a really, really simple way to start. but you could raise the ceiling on this a little bit and do some, um, let me put this back here. Uh, I don't see anybody in the waiting room. Let me see, I'm gonna see if I can make you a, uh, so I'll show you guys this project. So I made a little stoplight there. <clears throat> Let 
Okay, so in my stoplight, I've got the lights changing from red to yellow to green. And I've programmed this to just do this over and over again. Um, so it's got that same basic hack. I cut holes in a cup this time. And now if I put this up like so, ta-da, I've got a nice stoplight that I could use as part of a tiny town or something like that. Um, so that is an example of a little bit like raising the ceiling a little bit, doing a little bit more with your hummingbird. But now I wanna show you something that's a, even a little bit more advanced than that, something that ties to content as well. I'm gonna take this off my shelf back here. And if you're free, Matt, can you help me refocus that camera? Thanks. Um, so I think when we talk about equity, um, something, important, uh, something important for us to consider is that, um, where, where are we doing computer science and robotics? Um, if you're only offering computer science in an APCS course that students have to elect into, then you're probably not reaching all students because there's a lot of students that self-select out of classes like that. If you're only offering in, in after school, that's a great place to start. That's where I started, but not every kid can stay after school, right? So one of the big goals and one of the really unique and awesome things about Hummingbird is because you can make anything with it, you could put computer science in other classes really comfortably. Um, so this would be an example of a social studies or perhaps a science project. This is an interactive map of the migration patterns of monarch butterflies from Mexico up to Canada. So, um, something I knew, I knew that that, butter, that monarch butterflies went from Mexico to Canada and back down, but I didn't know they don't do it all in one generation. It actually takes them three generations to get all the way up north. So I indicated that with different colors of lights. So the ones down in Mexico are red lights. That's the first generation. The ones in the southeastern United States are um, second generation, and those are yellow lights. And then the ones up in Canada and uh, Michigan and up there, uh, Minnesota, those are green lights. And I can actually make this an interactive version of this map as well because I added a sensor on here. Actually, let me put it in from this side. That would be better. There we go. So check out the sensor that I added here. This sensor um, is a, a little dial sensor. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, and I've indicated the time of year. So see, it says March, April, May, June, July, etc. So I can go. I can turn my dial here, there we are, and turn it all the way back to March, and you can see that's down there in Mexico, and as I turn the dial and point to the different times of year, March, April, May, you can see, and I also indicate the generation that it is, as I turn my dial, the different generations and the time of year that you can find them there are all represented. Um, so this, uh, this could be my, butterfly migration patterns, or narwhals, or albatrosses, or whatever you can think of, or your kids can think of, or they're interested in. I'm actually really reminded of, um, I don't know if you guys are, are watching the show Atypical, on, uh, it's a Netflix show, but it's, there's a, a kid on there who's obsessed with penguins. And so he's a, a student on the autism spectrum. And so when we think about equity, let's not only think about girls, Let's not only think about students of color, let's think about our students with learning exceptionalities too. How could you invite them to the party as well? Put this back up on my shelf here. There we go. All right. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, bringing robotics into other classrooms, I think is a really great way to address that equity piece as well. So um, let me just show you briefly how to access all of the information that we've been um, talking about today so that you can come back and find this later. Um, if you just go to the BirdBrain website, and I'll kind of take us through here, and you go to Get Started, this takes you to the BirdBrain Learning Portal. This is where you can choose your product. Um, we were just working with the Hummingbird bit. In a couple months in spring, the Finch 2 will be on there, and I'll give you guys a quick demo, excuse me, of Finch 2 soon, um, in just a bit. So you'd select your robot, you'd select the programming device that your robot, uh, that you're working with. So I'm on a Windows machine, 
and then it'll tell you what options you have for your programming languages. Right now for Windows, we've got MakeCode or Snap or Python or Java. What I was working with before was an iPad, and you can see that the only option for an iPad right now is BirdBlock. So I'll go in that one just to keep it consistent. And then when you hit Get Started, it opens up through the portal all of our different, our four different tabs. There's Program, Build, Teach, and Resources. So exactly what I taught you in how to um, program an LED, we have different little modules here that are actually video modules that will teach you step by step. They start from, step one's just kind of an overview of what this is, but these are little videos and they actually loop. Um, so if I go to step two, it'll show you how to, pro how to plug it in, excuse me, just like I showed you. And this is a little looping video. There are explanations to the side here if those benefit you, but um, I think the videos generally just speak for themselves as well. So in this step, we show you exactly which blocks to drag out, right? Um, just like I did. And these videos don't have sound or anything, so I hear a lot of teachers that really like to use these to teach in the classroom in a couple of different ways. Number one, you could use these to learn yourself how to use all the different components. And with that, just to back up, we made the learning here really modular because the whole theory is that you should not have to know everything to do something. So if you want to make a dumb little project like this, not dumb, a um, simple, a simple little project like this right here, you only need to know single LEDs. If you want to start there, you can. You don't need to know how to use every bit of your kit to make your first project. Um, if you want to make um, uh, the, the, the arm that's in the background of my shot here, it moves up and down. Actually, I forgot to plug it in. Um, if you want to make that, all you need to know how to do is use a motor. This, pro this project just uses a motor and a couple of lights. So that's a really great biology project. You don't need to know everything to do something there, right? Um, so, uh, so that's in the programming tab, and we'll teach you how to use all the bits and pieces of your hummingbird. In the build tab, this is where at the bottom we have things like the, the hack that I just showed you about adding an LED. We have some for motors and LEDs. We've got some simple sample robots in the middle here. I particularly like the tiny drummer. These are for teachers who it's like, I've never really built anything before. I don't really care what I'm building in my class. I don't have to align it to curriculum. I just want my kids to have something quick and simple and easy to build to start out with. And I really like the tiny drummer because it allows, um, it, uh, what, I, what I tell kids to do is like, okay, here's the basic one. Here's a quick video that'll teach you to make a basic tiny drummer. And again, just to back it up to the beginning, it's a popsicle stick drumming on an upside down cup. That's the whole concept. But you tell kids, all right, now you make one based on and, and align it to your favorite song. Every kid has a favorite song. This summer, I got a lot of Old Town Road tiny drummers, which that happened. But, um, uh, but, but you can, and then I tell kids to like, okay, now this is the basic one, but like, get weird with it, make it your own. And they're adding two arms to it, and they're blinking lights, and they're adding lights to the drums, and they've got multiple drums, and they've got a symbol on it. I had somebody do Eye of the Tiger. Da, 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 da. It was awesome. And that's because that group was ready for it. So that really got to be inquiry-based learning. I love just seeing what kids come up with. If you give them a basic design and encourage them to riff on it, they get super weird and super cool real fast. Um, but there's also some things, uh, we have some mechanisms on here as well. Things like this um, cable system is pretty great. All of these mechanisms are made with basic craft supplies. This one is made with strings and straw and hot glue and cardboard. And that's it, those are things that you can find pretty easily. You, we don't think you should have to have a 3D printer or a CNC machine or a whole maker space to, uh, to um, make something cool, right? You sh if you just have craft supplies, that's all you really need. Um, so we've got all of that in the build on the build page. And on the teach page, this is where, I think it really opens up for teachers, because this is where we've got over 60 different projects that align to all different subjects in school that these were all done by real teachers in their classrooms. They actually taught these and aligned them to standards. And so you can see exactly what other teachers did. So if I look inside one like Robot Shakespeare, 
we've got a video of student work. And so I'll play that and I'll keep it muted. There we go. So students read um, Romeo and Juliet. These were eighth graders, read Romeo and Juliet. And then they had to, re each group got a scene that they were assigned and they had to record themselves reading the dialogue of that scene. And then they had to make a, a robotic version of that scene and sync up the motions and the lights to their dialogue that they read. And so as you can see underneath here, all the standards that this teacher aligned to, these are ELA standards. These are English and writing standards. Underneath here, she's got her lesson procedures. She's even got a printable that she links to. And then she's got videos of her students' verbal assessments. And then we always credit the teacher that we got these things from as well. So that is all on the teach page. You can even filter it based on like grade level and subject area. So you can say, I'm interested in like upper elementary and middle school, like art, music, history, somewhere in there, and you can see what projects are available for that. So that's all on the teach page. And then the resources page, I think is one of the most important pages because it's got all of those printable student resources and printable teacher resources. Like there's a lesson plan on here called Your First Hour of Robotics, and it helps you weave together helps you weave together the programming, the building, and the aligning to content. I really like the bee waggle dance version of it. And so if we take a look at this, it's sort of an overview of the lesson with some suggested teaching time and craft supplies and hardware. We talk a little bit about computational thinking and tell you how to prep your room. We give you, the teacher, like the answer code of a possible solution for what they're asking. But the kids watch a video about how bees communicate by wiggling back and forth. And then they're asked the question, how can you recreate the motion of a bee waggle dance with robotic components? And so then we get into the lesson plan. You teach the single LED and the position servo module. I remember I said those were really modular. You just do those two. You watch this video, you ask the question and introduce the challenge. Give them some time to build a little styrofoam bee like, uh, I think it's down at the bottom here. Like this guy, a little styrofoam bee. And then you have a little showcase at the end. Maybe you play Fly to the Bumblebee, right? So um, this is a, a really great printable resource that teachers can use to translate all of these resources, all of these programming tutorials and building tutorials into a classroom experience. We also have printable student resources like um, these coding cards here. The coding cards, um, they're, you can print them out. I printed them, laminated them, and put them on a key ring because that works for me. Um, and on the front, they have how and where to plug in a component, like a single color LED. And on the back, they give the kids some sample code, tell them what it does, and give them a little challenge. How could you make this LED blink faster? So I really like this as a resource. So I was saying that there's a bunch of different ways that you could teach um, how your kids how to program. First way, Use those programming video tutorials to teach yourself and then sort of do some direct instruction with kids. Um, way number two is send them directly to the website and they can learn to program those things by watching those videos on their own. And uh, a side benefit of those video tutorials is you don't have to be able to read or read English to be able to use those. So I have teachers who are ESL, like English as a Second Language teachers, um, or teachers who work with deaf students whose language development skills tend to be a little bit behind who really appreciate those video tutorials because you don't have to read that text on the side if it's not working for you. So those are two ways. And then the third way would be to use the coding cards here and to let the kids just kind of either work through them or teach everybody LEDs and motors together and then give them this pack of coding cards with all the different cards. And when they want to learn to use the rotational motor, they'll learn to use it from here. When they want to learn the distance sensor, they can learn it from here, right? So that's a lot of information about hummingbirds. Um, looks like some people are asking some questions in the chat window. If anybody has any questions about hummingbird, um, be sure to ask them in there. I'm gonna start to give you a little demo of our Finch 2.0. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about Finch 2.0. Um, but if anybody has any questions about Hummingbird that I didn't cover, be sure to ask those in the chat window and Matt's going to keep up there. So, all right, so this little guy here, this is the Finch 2.0. So um, this is a total redesign of our Finch 1.0. The Finch 1.0 has been out for about eight to 10 years or so. 
this guy is going to start shipping in the spring. So it's brand stinking new. Um, this is actually a 3D printed prototype. It's a working prototype so that I can go out to conferences and do workshops and webinars like this with it before we get our real ones that are coming. Um, I think we're getting the first batch next week. So these are brand new. Luckily, Mark uh, has kind of hooked up with bird brain, so we're bringing brand new stuff to, uh, to Michigan here, which is very cool. Um, but it's got some really cool features. Let me show you first. I'm going to turn it on. All right. Ooh, this one's just that dead. So it might have a little bit more juice in it. Yeah, this one's has a little more juice. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Matt thought ahead and grabbed two finches because he's a, a smart guy. So uh, same, same as with the hummingbird, you can use a laptop, a Chromebook, a, um, a, a iPad, a tablet, you can use all kinds of different things to program the Finch 2.0. And you can do it tethered with a, a USB cord, like so, or you can do it untethered with Bluetooth. It can do all those different things. It really just depends on the experience you want. And as of March, we'll also have all of the learning materials that go with it, just like we have with Hummingbird. I'm furiously writing Finch getting started tutorials right now. Um, so those will be, you can find those on the portal in just a little while. Um, but uh, so both Hummingbird and Finch can do text-based coding like Python and Java. Um, they can both do block-based coding like make code, snap, bird blocks, scratch, etc. cetera. Um, but the Finch can also do icon-based programming, which is even simpler than block-based coding. So let me show you what that looks like. So you could use bird blocks to program the Finch, but you guys have already seen that. So I'm going to show you Finch blocks. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see it. There we go. So Finch blocks looks like so. This is another... Uh, we call it an icon-based programming language because you don't even have to be able to read to use this. You could use this at the pre-K or kindergarten level. So I'm going to connect to my finch first. So I found my finch out of a sea of finches. There we go, sound of success. And if I want to build an algorithm, I could drag just these icons up here. So it's going to go forward, it's going to turn to the left, and then I want the LEDs in the beak to go red, and then to go blue, and then to play a couple different notes. So you could see how a kindergartner can even do this. So let me scooch this back. And now watch, when I hit the green flag, it's going to show you which part of the sequence I'm on. Green flag, it's gonna go forward, it's gonna turn, the nose is gonna go red, tail's gonna go blue, and then it plays a couple of notes. So you could see how you could use this in a kindergarten classroom um, to do things like, now in, our, in the real version of Finch, it's gonna have a hole in the middle. This one doesn't because it's a prototype, but it has a hole in the middle for like a marker. So you can make a marker stick out the bottom and you can like draw shapes with it and things. So you could have students do something like, okay, write an algorithm. You can introduce that term at the kindergarten level. Write an algorithm, which is just a sequence of steps, to draw a square. And so maybe you have kids walk it out first and you say, okay, to draw a square, pretend you're a marker, you're gonna have to go forward, you're gonna have to turn, you're gonna have to walk forward and then turn, right? Let's walk it out and now let's program that on your finch. So you can start with concepts like sequencing and algorithms at a very early level, but that's just level one of finch blocks. If I go up to level three, that would be more appropriate for like third, fourth, fifth grade maybe, because now I have control over how far it goes. I don't want it to go 10 centimeters, I want it to go just five centimeters, real short, or eight centimeters. And watch this. Um, if I want it to turn, if I want it to turn left, you know what, I don't want it to turn 90 degrees. Watch this icon as I drag this over. I want it to turn all the way around 180 degrees. There we go like so. So it's starting to build some angle knowledge. And I want the nose to go pink, and I want it to last for half of a second, and I want the tail to go yellow and last for half of a second. So you get a little bit more control, and you even start to get some control blocks, like a repeat forever loop, or a repeat a certain number of times loop. So I can just repeat this whole sequence twice. I'm going to snap that in there. Okay, here we go. Let's run this algorithm now. 
Ready, set, go. Forward, turn all the way around, nose, tail. It's gonna repeat it twice, remember? So it's showing me which step it's on, and I really love this feature. Because I've used things in the classroom, I've, I've worked with kindergartners before, and I've used stuff like Bbox, and I think those are totally great little tools. But the, the trouble that I have with them is like you, you punch the buttons on the top of the Bbot, and then it goes and does the algorithm, and by the time it's doing the sequence, I've like lost track of what I punched into the top of it. And so that learning is like separated by time. And I really like that in this algorithm, it actually shows you which step it's on, on your screen, so that um, you can start to see, you can start to make those connections um, for yourself and start to see what the connection between what we did here and what we did here is in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, so, okay, we're doing, we're doing great on time, this is perfect. Um, so, just a couple of, of last notes about equity. Um, the reason, we, we tried to be really, really thoughtful in how we designed all of the learning materials that go with Hummingbird and that go with Finch. Um, because um, equity is at the core of why, why these two tools were invented. Um, and, but something that you know, and that I know as an educator who's you know, been around the block a little bit, is that technology isn't gonna save us, right? Technology isn't going to save um, the classroom. Teachers are gonna save the classroom. Teachers are going to um, save students. So it doesn't matter how good the tool is. It, it matters how good the tool is, but it really matters how you teach it. So we know that how we teach matters, but I have a graph, I recreated it on cardboard because that's what we do here. I have a graph I wanted to show you. So this is a graph that tracks student motivation to learn, low motivation, high motivation, with how much scaffolding is offered in the classroom. This is a graph that I found in um, Hello World, which is a quarterly magazine. Um, and again, this is a approximation with Sharpies. But um, there was like open-ended learning, where it's just sort of like there's no goal, it's just sort of like ex exploration-based. There's inquiry-based learning where students are asking questions and then answering them. And then there's direct instruction where teachers are saying like step-by-step, step, no, no, we're not doing that now, come back here. You're going too fast, you're going too slow, right? Direct instruction. And so I've got two lines here. The blue one indicates um, boys' motivation to learn. And the red one indicates girls' motivation to learn. And you can see with like open-ended um, instruction, uh, if students don't know what the goal is and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing, that would be like just putting out a hummingbird and no, like not a whole lot of learning support materials or anything and just being like, ah, figure it out. Some students do okay with that, but a lot of students are like, well, what are we supposed to be doing? They're not super motivated to learn at that point. When you get into inquiry based where you say, what animal do you want to make? Right? And they say, we want to make, just as an example of this, I had a girl in my after school program who she, I, I always got like 50 applicants for my program and only 25 spots. So I would go to the teachers at the school and I would ask their opinion of girls to see, you know, who should I let into my program? Who should I not? And this was a girl that every teacher that I talked to said, you don't want her in your program. <laughs> and th that's actually why I asked teachers that because I was looking for those girls to put in my program. They're like, she's, disruptive, she gets out of her seat all the time, she's super emotional, and she was, she did all of those things, that was all true, um, but she needed an after school program, right? But when we were doing the, the, the robot petting zoo, she and her group of four girls, they decided they were gonna do a bunny, and this was a bunny that one of them had at home, and they were all friends, so they knew this bunny, was, I don't remember its name, and they decided that the thing they wanted it to do was they were gonna put a light sensor on its head, and when you pet the bunny, it was gonna hop, which is like a sort of mechanically advanced thing to do. Um, and I was like, all right, that's okay, we can do this. But this girl who was super disruptive and emotional and all the things was so motivated to program to get it to hop, we ended up having to use variables to like slow the motors down to bring the feet, which are made of popsicle sticks up, and then speed it up with a variable to, to make it hop like that. And it, it kind of, it sort of loped, it was fine. But she was so motivated to learn that she was a fifth grader using variables. 
She was so into it. Um, so that's what inquiry-based learning and motivation to learn looks like. But when you get into direct instructions, uh, direct instruction, boys' motivation to learn tapers a little bit, but girls' motivation to learn tanks. And so I think if we're only teaching, like, and that's direct instruction is how most computer science, as, especially at the AP level, has traditionally been taught. There's textbooks, it's very linear, right? We do this, 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 and this. And if you think about it, that's kind of the way we had to teach coding before there was block-based coding. When you're doing stuff in Java and Python, if you miss a slash, your program doesn't work. So like, you've got to tell people exactly what to do or else their program won't work. Um, but with block-based coding, you can really experiment with it. It can actually be inquiry-based. So it's not just that the system favors boys, which I'm sure we can all agree that sometimes it does, it, or it traditionally did, and we're the people working to fix that, right? You, me, all the educators across the country who are interested in equity and CS. Um, but also, the tools that we had at our disposal a decade ago weren't really conducive to inquiry-based learning. They were conducive to how boys learn, which is direct instruction. But we have new tools now. And they say, when you know better, do better, right? And we can do better now. Um, so I really appreciate that both with Hummingbird and with Finch, it can be super inquiry-based. Um, but again, it's not the tools that are gonna save us and create equity. It's how we use them that really creates equity. So I wanna point that out. Um, okay, so in our last couple minutes here, um, I'll, I'll give you a couple like what to do, where to go from here's. Um, first of all, if you would like a demo, if you would like to try out a hummingbird, if you don't have one in your school um, right now, there we go, you can get a demo kit. So you can, um, you can contact me, and my contact info is in the, um, in the Google Doc. You can get a demo kit. To, uh, we'll, we'll ship it to your school totally free. You don't have to pay shipping or anything like that. You can hang on to it for two months, try it out. And if at the end of those two months you want to keep it, you get 20% off of it. Um, the regular educator discount, by the way, is 10%. So anything you want to buy, you get 10% off if you're an educator. Um, but if you keep your demo kit, you get 20% off, which is cool. Um, and then the other thing that you might be interested in after this is um, talking about like either purchasing hardware, which again, I'm the PD coordinator, so I can hook you up with our purchasing people. But if you're interested in talking about hardware, how do, how do I put this across my district? Could I get one classroom set of this and share it among teachers? Would it live in my STEM lab? Where would this fit? Um, that would really be something that I would love to talk to you about. It's something that I've worked with a lot of different di districts across the country to do. So I've seen ways in which hummingbird, they, people buy hummingbirds and they sit on a shelf and don't go anywhere. And I've seen ways that they've bought hummingbirds and they are checked out all the time. And that's the goal. Like the, the, the sale is the sale, right? But uh, so, so from a, if we were just like a regular for-profit company, that's all we care about. But what I really care about, I hate to hear of these things sitting in a closet. So I wanna work with teachers to integrate these across many classrooms, many content areas, and the purpose is equity. I wanna get these in the hands of the kids who haven't had a chance to do it before. Um, so, and there's a bunch of different ways that we could connect. Either I could come to you and we could do an on-site workshop, we could do some live stream learning things like this. Um, live stream learning specifically, that's when like you have a robot in front of you and I have a robot in front of me and you're in your school and I'm in this room and we're learning together usually for a couple hours and we'll go through the basics. Sometimes we can schedule a few of those over the course of a couple weeks. Um, or we also have some self-paced video courses, which are um, little videos and it's me and Matt um, and we talk and there are faces and robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so those, and they're, they're self-paced so that you can go through those at your own pace. It's about an hour's worth of content, but a lot of times at the end of a video, we'll have like a little challenge, like a little coding challenge. So we'll say like, all right, can you get your light to blink faster? We'll see you in the next video with a potential solution. Um, so if you're interested in those, they're going to be up on our PD page on our website very soon, um, probably within the next couple of weeks. Um, so at least one of those will be up. So I would certainly love to talk to you guys about any of those things, but I will, uh, I'll stick around on the call for a few minutes. Look at that, right at five o'clock. Who's good at time management? This gal. Um, 
And uh, just as we're finishing up here, actually, Mark, do you want to say anything about um, the McCall conference? I, uh, if I scroll down here, I put a link in there to the McCall conference with some dates. I'm going to be doing some Finch and Hummingbird workshops during it as well. So keep your eyes peeled for those. But do you want to share anything else about the conference? No, we're looking forward to it. Uh, I'm really excited to have Kelsey and the team. Uh, so you can pick them up in two different spots. Kelsey is going to have workshops. Also has uh, a current concurrent session that you can come check her out. And she'll also be in our innovative playground this year. So it's a little bit of a new model to our old makerspace. Uh, we redid it to really be a much more hands-on, in-depth uh, playground to come experience the items. And Kelsey will be there doing that for us for a couple days as well. Yep. Um, and then the basic information is right there at mccallconference.org. We'd love to see uh, as many of you there as possible. Yes, very cool. Um, so I mentioned that you could um, that you could borrow a kit too. There's a form right here. If you want to borrow a kit, you can just click on that form right there and fill it out and we will get a, a demo kit to you for 60 days too. I forgot I put that in there. Um, uh, or if you want to meet me at McCall, I think, I don't think this link works. I think this link will take you to somewhere else. So I'm going to take that out. I don't think I've set that up yet. Sorry. Um, but if anybody else has any questions, if you want to unmute yourself and just ask them verbally, that's totally fine at this point. I'll put it back here so you got those calls to action. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today, joining me and Mark today, and we will look forward to seeing you at the McCall Conference. Um, we're also doing one more webinar together in February, right? Is it on February 12th? Yep, we're, uh, we're going to make a giant focus on literacy. Michigan, yes. like so many other states, has a third grade reading law, and we're going to uh, approach an ELA in literacy uh, with coding in uh, robots. Pretty we're exciting. Gonna be making some, uh, we're going to be talking about some robot poetry. We're going to be doing some robot Shakespeare. We're going to be doing some robot characters. It's going to be fancy. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm glad you got back. Sorry you got kicked off for a little bit. We'll, we will send everybody the, um, the uh, recording of this so you can certainly watch whatever you missed. And feel free to share this video with anybody that you want, anyone that you wish was here, um, uh, that you wish could have joined us. So, Jennifer, Grand Rapids will be a blast. You're right, Mary Weaver. Grand Rapids will be a blast. I'm just catching up on some of the messages I missed. Yeah, I'm just seeing, uh, is Helen still on here? She is. Helen, I just saw that you you um, bought some hummingbirds during the summer, but you've been a little scared to use them in the classroom. So if you have any questions at all about anything, you know, you, I, I kind of showed you how to get started through that portal. So whether you've got Chromebooks or laptops or iPads, if you go through that portal, those video tutorials will show you right where to start. They'll even show you how to set up your device. And if you need to download anything, they've got all that through those video tutorials. So that should be easy for you to just kind of get started there. But if you have any questions about anything or just want to chat with me for 20 minutes or an hour or something, just um, send me an email. Let me know. And we can always just set up a, a quick chat, um, maybe even to just plan your first day. Um, my biggest recommendation would be to look at the um, B Waggle lesson plan. I think that's a really strong lesson plan to use for your first day and um, of teaching just to kind of get it out there and just like, be a lead learner and try something, you know, um, and then to use those video to those uh, programming tutorials too. So, so glad uh, everyone could join us today. Looks like we've got a couple more coming in down here. All right. February 12th at 7 p.m. for the literacy webinar. Great. All right. Well, if nobody else has any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and log off for the, uh, for the day, for the evening. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. This was really great. So awesome. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye, Kelsey. Great to see you again. All right.